One of the things that I look most forward to in Mexico at Christmas time is buñuelos. It's this very thin, crispy fritter, I guess you would call it. And we start with making a yeast dough. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about buñuelos in a minute, but we gotta get the uh, dough started here. Um, this is a package of instant you know, active dry yeast. I'm gonna put that into a bowl and add the half a cup of water. Of course, everything will be in the recipes connected to this video. Um, usually what we will do is to add just a little bit of sugar to help get this thing started. And it's just enough to kind of make that yeast come back to life. And we're gonna just let that sit for a minute. Um, and sit for a minute to see that the yeast is active. This is a standard thing. Some people say you can skip this step, um, but I always like to make sure I, that the yeast is really active before I go on to making the whole dough so I don't waste anything in case it's not. Okay, so for the last 30 years, I've spent every Christmas in Oaxaca. And Oaxaca is known for these really famous stalls that have the buñuelos. Now they make buñuelos that are huge and I would never ask you to do that because it takes all kinds of special talent and equipment to do that with. So I'm going to show you how to make smaller buñuelos that are way, way, way more manageable. If you go over to Michoacan and you go to some of the big plazas that are in Morelia, the capital, or over in Tepatzcuaro, you'll see these stalls there that have these huge like 14 15 inch buñuelos stacked up now typically in mexico you will order them either what they would call mojado or rociado um, mojado would mean dipped into this piloncillo raw sugar syrup and pulled right back out it's a little odd to most americans because you take something crisp and you start to make it soft in this syrup a little bit like a sweet chilaquiles, if you can kind of wrap your head around that. Or rociado would just be that same syrup sprinkled over the top. Now my favorite dulceria or sweet shop in Mexico City, one that's been there for over a century, they make buñuelos and they sort of reduce the syrup and spread that on top or brush that on top. And what they come out with is my very favorite buñuelo. So if you go to Mexico and it's Christmas time, ask where you can find buñuelos. In Mexico City, you go out south into Coyoacan where they have lots of street performers and things like that, and you'll find the stalls where they're making buñuelos right in front of you. Okay, so I'm looking down here and starting to see a little bit of activity. Some of the yeast is starting to what I would call bloom. It's just sort of popping up. In a couple more minutes, we'll be to the point where we can see that it's really very active. Active. I'm just going to let this sit for an hour so that we can continue on with the dough for the buñuelos. I have weighed out a pound of flour. Many of you know that I love to work with weights because that gives me consistency, not only in baking, but just in regular cooking as well. If you don't have a scale to weigh out a pound of flour, um, it's about three and a quarter cups, but it all depends on how you pack it into those cups. Um, so I'm going to take my pound of flour about a half a cup of this. We're making what's called a sponge here. So I'm just going to stir the, the flour now into this active yeast and water and a little bit of sugar mixture. And this sponge um, will be the flavor of what we're making here. Some people don't do this part of it. They just go ahead and put everything together and make their, their dough. But I have found that if you'll do this step and leave this set for an hour at least, then you're gonna have a much more flavorful buñuelo. I'll tell you, if you're planning ahead and probably if you're gonna make buñuelos, you're planning ahead, do this the night before, put this into the refrigerator and let it slowly mature at that colder temperature overnight. And I'm going uh, to work with one that we actually started here uh, yesterday. Now's the time to transform this sponge into the finished dough. It's a pretty rich dough. It's going to have a little butter in it. Uh, most of the... I mean, most of the liquid in the dough is the eggs that I'm cracking into this bowl now. I'm going to use a small spoon here. 
about a teaspoon in there. I've got my small amount of butter at room temperature. I want these eggs to be beaten some before they go in. You'll see why in a second, because the dough is kind of heavy. Okay, so now into this flour is gonna go our active sponge. I can smell it's very yeasty and it's very bubbly. So we've got that, then the eggs will go in next, beaten with the salt so that the salt dissolves, and then the butter will go in, softened butter. And I'm gonna use the dough hook here. Now, if you're working by hand and you don't have a stand mixer like this, you'll just literally use a big spoon and mix it all together, and then you're going to knead it. So I always start these things off at a sort of slowish speed here until all of the flour has been moistened by the liquid. And then we're gonna let this mixer go for about five minutes to knead it. If you're doing all this work by hand, you would knead for about 10 minutes until the dough is very smooth looking. Okay, after five minutes, this is what it looks like. And you can see that it's a sticky dough. If I just turn this off and I touch it with my fingers here, you could see how sticky that is. Well, that's not. We want it to be a soft dough, but we don't want it to be that sticky. So now on a low speed here, I'm gonna add a little bit more flour. I can tell you that it's gonna take probably about a, a quarter to a third of a cup more. Um, to work that in so that it's not just such a sticky dough. Soft again, but not sticky. I'm pretty happy with what we've got there, so I'm gonna turn that off um, and then scrape the dough down. It's a heavy dough, you can see that. It doesn't look like a light br uh, bread dough, um, but because it's got eggs and butter and that sort of thing in it, Okay, so this I'm gonna scrape now into a lightly oiled bowl. I don't know if you have a pastry scraper like that, but I really love it when working with just pretty much any kind of dough, partly because it goes up against the side of the bowl so well. And so I've got everything there. So when I say that I want it to be soft but not sticky. That's what I'm talking about is that I can do that with my hand and it doesn't stick to my hand, okay? But it's still real soft. If I put my hand completely in there, of course it would stick to it. Uh, cover that with some plastic wrap and then I'm gonna let that sit in a warm place until it's about double in bulk. That'll take anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours depending on how cold the kitchen is. I'll see you back when this has been risen. I thought we'd just take advantage of the time while the dough is rising to make the syrup. It is a piloncillo syrup. You could do this with dark brown sugar, of course, uh, but piloncillo has its own unique flavor because this is completely unrefined sugar. This is cane, the juice out of just squeezed cane, sugar cane, that is boiled down and it's not refined in any way. And so it makes these blocks of cone sugar. You can find these, of course, in any Mexican grocery store. Um, but there's all kinds of things that you could find in other grocery stores besides brown sugar. You could get the palm sugar that's uh, available in a lot of different places that will give you this really rich flavor as well. Okay, so I'm gonna put the, um, the piloncillo cone now into a pan here and pour over the water. I put this pan over about a medium heat here. It's going to take a little while for the, uh, the piloncillo to really melt here, so I don't like to go too quickly with it. Uh, flavorings that we're going to put in this are a couple of cloves and then it's anise seed. And anise seed is going to take about a quarter of a teaspoon of anise seed. But that is one of the things that is really, I think, absolutely delicious and almost imperative in this kind of piloncillo syrup. A piece of Mexican cinnamon that we're going to throw in there. And to add that little wonderful citrus note. I'm gonna put a big piece of orange peel in there. All of these things 
could be modified and everybody's got their own versions of these kinds of things. But when I think of this Piloncillo syrup, I think of the anise seed as being one of the most definitive flavors in there. You don't like anise seed, you don't have to put it in there. I'm just gonna let this simmer and I'll show you what it looks like when it's reduced and really gotten thick enough that you can do what I'm looking for, which is to brush it over the finished buñuelos. We've got a very puffy dough. It's about a double in size there, and I'm gonna turn it out onto a floured board here. Um, I always like to flour my hand to get it out of the, out of the bowl uh, so it doesn't stick because it will have a different consistency than when you put it in there. It really does change quite a bit. And now I'm just gonna press it out into a big rectangle and then divide it into 24 even pieces. Okay, the first thing that we need to do is to roll out the little ball of dough. I like to press it out a little bit just to flatten the disc there. And then I'm using a small rolling pin that I bought in northern Mexico that was designed for rolling out flour tortillas. And I'm gonna get it as thin as I possibly can. If it sticks ever to the rolling pin, then You'll need to re-flour it a little bit. And you'll notice that I'm doing it about an eighth to a quarter of a turn. That makes sure that it's not sticking on the bottom at all. Um, so I, I constantly am moving it. And of course, you don't want to roll a lot of flour into this or it'll taste floury. So I'm going to get it out to about six inches, maybe a little bit more. And then I'm going to stretch it to eight inches and this is the cool thing that you'll see when you see the street vendors making this they're stretching them over a cloth covered pot now in mexico they typically will use a bean pot an earthenware bean pot like this so i'm just going to unroll this tea towel you want something that's a flat weave towel like that and then I just stretch it and pleat it kind of evenly like that. And then again, on this side, we'll tuck all of the tea towel underneath here, go back around and re-pleat it to make sure that it's looking nice. You don't have to fuss with this too much, but most people actually just take a rubber band to keep the tea towel in place. So we stretch that over there, nicely pleated. I need to put a little bit of flour now into this. And this is what we're gonna stretch it over. Of course, if you don't have a earthenware bean pot, you don't need one. Just any kind of bowl that you could cover with a tea towel will, will work for this. Okay, now this rolled very thin piece I'm going to stretch. So you want to drape it kind of evenly over all of this and then just go around and you're going to stretch it with your keeping your thumb on the outside and your other fingers underneath. You're going to sort of stretch it and drape it, stretch it and drape it like that. And what you're using is gravity to keep it secured on the other side until we have about an eight inch piece. So my hand span is about eight inches. So that's about the right amount there. And then we wanna poke five or six little holes in it, like little quarter inch ones. That'll allow steam to come out as we are frying this. So I've got this at a 360 degrees right now. So I'm going to lay this buñuelo into the hot oil. And you'll notice right away it'll start blistering. You can see that the steam is escaping, but I'm using my tongs to kind of keep it submerged here. Okay. It'll take about a minute on each side. Okay, once it's gotten to a golden brown color, 
pick it up and drain all the oil off of it and then drain it on paper towels. I'm going to make a few more of these guys. This has reduced now this piloncillo syrup and you have to test it to see if it's actually going to do what we're looking for it to do. And you have to work with it when it's hot, but you want to know what it's going to do when it's cool. So I'll just take a little bit of this and drop it on the plate. And this plate I had in the refrigerator so that it could be a really cold plate. And then I want to, as it cools off, begin to touch it and see if it's sticking to me. See, it doesn't stick to me at all anymore. So that is, means that it's exactly at the right place now. So we're ready to, sp well, I was going to say brush. I was going to say spread it on, but it's really going to be brushing it on. Oh, by the way, you have all of the uh, spices in here and the orange peel, all of that stuff. You'd probably want to pour that through a strainer right now before you go on to doing it. But I'm just going to show you what this is, is like. If the piloncillo syrup cools off and it gets really thick, just rewarm it in a microwave for a few seconds and it'll soften up again. Of course, you're going to be making buñuelos for a big party, for a Christmas party. And even though I'm doing this in 2020 when nobody's having big parties, you got to know how to make these things so that you can do something very special, very traditional, muy, muy mexicano para celebrar la Navidad. I hope you'll tackle these things because they are so utterly delicious. <music> Tacos de bacalao. Now, these will surprise you. Okay, I'm just finishing cutting some onions here for the next page in our taco manual, which is tacos de bacalao. Now, I know right away, some of you are going to say, that's a Christmas dish, you're only supposed to have it then. But I could take you to so many places in Mexico City and Veracruz where they make bacalao year-round because it's just too good to relegate to just one time of the year. So for those of you that don't know what bacalao is, it's a salt cod dish. And the first thing that you gotta do is to find the salt cod. Sometimes when you find bacalao in the market, it's in these little wooden boxes and the stuff is just hard as a rock. That's not really good quality bacalao. In Mexico, especially at Christmas time, you will find people selling big sides of bacalao, usually from Norway, but occasionally from Spain. Um, and what they're telling you that you look for is a little bit of flexibility in it. it should be rock hard and it's going to be coated in salt because obviously it is salt cod so it's something that you can keep around for a long time you don't have to worry about freshness except when it gets so old that it's rock hard okay so the first step that you're going to do when you're making your tacos de bacalao is start the day ahead and put the salt cod into water so i've got some soaking over here i've changed the water three times actually in the last 24 hours, just so that when the salt soaks out, I can get rid of that salt, put fresh water on and soak more salt out. So we're just gonna leave that there while we start the flavorings that go on in this. I've got a Dutch oven over here that's heated to about, on, over about medium heat. And I think there was a little bit of liquid in my olive oil because I poured something in there from an olive uh, container. Okay, so now I've got that burnt off there. And I'm going to put the onions that I chopped in there and we want to get those to lightly browned. And while that is browning there, first of all, of course, you want to stir everything around so that the olive oil coats the onions. And then while that is browning there, I'm going to chop up this garlic.
after I did the garlic, I chopped up a bunch of parsley as well. Parsley is really the thing that flavors this, not cilantro, kind of interestingly enough, because these flavors are really very Mediterranean in their origin. I pulled off all of the tough stems of the parsley um, before I started chopping, but the little tender stems I left in there. And now we're going to uh, put some tomatoes in here. I find that this most consistently is made from canned tomatoes. Um, a lot of times the fresh tomatoes that people use to make it actually, well, they're just not ripe enough to give you the color that you're looking for. So I usually rely on canned tomatoes and we're just gonna blend that. Now, you'll notice I didn't blend it very much because I still want some pieces in there. That gives a really beautiful look to the tomatoes. These onions are not only really delicious smelling, but they're really beautifully browned here. I'm going to scoop up the garlic that I chopped earlier and I put it in here. Um, my standard is that when garlic goes into the pot with the onions, the onions should basically be ready and you stir the garlic only uh, the limited amount that it needs to release its aroma. I can already smell that beautiful garlic in there, but it usually takes a little, about a minute, maybe a little bit less. And then I am going to add to this pot those coarsely pureed tomatoes. And I'm gonna turn up the heat a little bit here and then reduce this until it's almost the consistency of tomato paste. Okay, these tomatoes are almost cooked down to where I want them to be. That concentration will bring out sweetness and you're gonna want sweetness to balance the flavor of the salt cod. While this is finishing, I'm gonna take the soaked pieces of salt cod and put them into boiling water and I'm going to blanch them for about five minutes. This amount of time is not crucial, but it's just to bring out the last bits of the salt that was used to preserve the fish. So after five minutes, I will transfer that cod over into this tomato mixture. Cod has poached now. It shouldn't fall apart or anything like that, but you'll notice that it will give off a little bit of an odor of dried fish, which is also a nice thing to kind of blanch out of it at this point. Um, and now I'm gonna add all the other flavoring ingredients that are really classic in bacalao. I've sliced up some green olives, manzanillos are the main one that you will find used in Mexico. Pickled jalapenos, buy a jar or can of them, cut them in half lengthwise, scrape out the seeds, and then slice them lengthwise. Those go into the pot. We've got hierbas de olor, which are thyme, marjoram, and bay that oftentimes is sold fresh in Mexico in bundles. I'm using some dried here. And then we have that parsley that I've already chopped up and we're going to add now some water. This will take um, about a cup or so, and I'm just gonna stir all of that together. We want the consistency basically of marinara sauce. That's what we're looking for here. So everybody knows what that consistency is, so add water to hit that. And now I'm going to turn the heat down a little bit, put the top askew here. And now we're gonna let this simmer for about 20 to 30 minutes until all of that cod starts to fall apart. This is smelling really delicious. And what I need to show you is how the salt cod has now cooked enough that it's really flaking apart. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna flake it apart using this wooden spatula here. Um, I wanna break it up into fairly small pieces um, and that's not hard to do and doesn't really take very much time at all. But just break it up and then that will be the size pieces that are in your taco de bacalao. I think I've gotten most of it done here. While it was, 
while this was cooking, I chopped up a whole bunch of potatoes, those little red skin boiling potatoes. That's the sort of waxy texture that I really love in this kind of a preparation. Um, and potatoes and bacalao are really, really amazing together. So I am now going to put these potatoes in on top of it. Then I'll stir them together, put the top back on and let that cook for about 15 minutes or so, just until our little small diced potatoes are completely cooked through. I'll meet you back in about 15 minutes. This is looking really good. I'm gonna stir it a little bit just to bring everything together. It should hold its shape in a spoon. Should be able to stir through the pot and see the bottom of the pot. It's time to taste it now and see if it needs any salt. Now, one thing that you have to know about this is that salt cod will still have retained some of its salt. So you don't wanna over salt this. That's why I taste it and mm, it's almost perfectly salted, just a tiny bit under. So I'm just gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt over the top of it there, stir that in, and we're ready to make these delicious bacalao tacos. Okay, a couple of fresh tortillas here on the plate. And then I'm going to take some of the of the bacalao and pile that on. Now, I like to add a little bit of extra spice to it, but not in terms of a salsa. This has all the salsa-like ingredients already in it, and so we don't really need that at all. So I am going to put some of these pickled jalapenos over the top, absolutely one of my very favorite parts of all of this, and that will do the trick and then we've got tacos de bacalao for any time of the year hey welcome to my kitchen everyone thank you so much for watching I've got a really big deal for you today. I'm going to make mole with you, but I'm going to make mole what I call the beginner's mole. Now this isn't, if you've seen a recipe that I've done before that's called the, the peanut mole, that's more like a pipion and super, super simple and very delicious. I have to say, I turn to that recipe all the time. But if you want to really tackle an honest mole, like the classic mole poblano with three different dried chilies in it and so forth. Well, you know, you really have to go through certain steps, but I've sort of truncated some of those steps to make it really easy. So if you've always been intimidated by making a real mole, I'm gonna make a small batch with you that's one of the big things because usually people make mole in huge, huge batches. So I'm going to make a small batch that, honest to goodness, you can tackle. Anyone can tackle. So let's talk about the ingredients first, okay? So we have three different dried chilies here. So we have, uh, this is an, a mulatto chili, and this is the ancho chili. Now, they look kind of different in size, but lots of times they look almost exactly the same in size. The mulatto chili is always darker, and the ancho chili is redder. Some places in the world, they will call just this mulatto an ancho negro, like a black ancho, because that's kind of what it is when they're fresh. Both of these are poblano chilies, just different varieties of poblano chilies. Okay, so we've got the mulatto and the ancho chili, and then we've got the other really dark chili. This is the pasilla chili, or sometimes called pasilla negro or pasilla largo, long. So it's either black pasilla or it is called the long pasilla. So you have to know those kinds of things because when you go to the Mexican grocery store or you order online, you're likely going to find some differences in names. If I were you, I would probably order these things online, but if you want the adventure, then go into your Mexican grocery store and talk to them. Say, I'm looking for ancho, mulato, pasilla to make mole. Everybody will know what you're talking about because this is really the star dish 
in the Mexican kitchen. First step is to clean these guys. So we're going to pull the stem and the seed pod out like that and tear them open. Now I'll let all of the seeds fall out. And then if you wanna make it a little less spicy, you pull out the veins. I never do that, but a lot of people will tell you that that's what you should be doing. And then we're gonna tear every chili into four pieces like that. Okay, that was five pieces. Okay, I've got my work cut out for me here. Now I'm gonna just take a moment to de-seed and stem all of these chilies and get them ready for the next stage of cooking, which will be an, what we call an oil toasting. <music> Okay, so these are the chilies all torn up right now. And I suggest that you make this in a big Dutch oven or a heavy pot. You're gonna need something that basically is six to eight quarts and the heavier, the better. In Mexico, traditional uh, kitchens, it would be an earthenware cazuela. They heat up very, very slowly, but then they hold and distribute the heat incredibly evenly and for a really long time. Now, this looks like a Mexican cazuela, but it's actually enamel-coated cast iron. I'm lucky enough to have a couple of these really cool looking pieces, but any kind of a Dutch oven will, will work. I turned on the heat underneath this uh, right when I started doing the chilies so that it could heat up and be uniformly hot. The next thing you have to choose is how you're going to cook these, what you're gonna cook these oil toasted chilies in. It could be a vegetable oil, it could be olive oil, but I think it's a waste of olive oil and it really doesn't give you a flavor that's harmonious with anything in this dish. The opposite end of the spectrum from vegetable oil would be fresh rendered pork lard. And if you want the really traditional flavor, then that's what you could use. And this is what we get from one of our local farmers or you could find it in the Mexican grocery store back near the meat counter and um, this is not the stuff that comes in little bricks um, that is hydrogenated. That stuff doesn't have flavor. You want to get fresh rendered pork lard or use vegetable oil. Now, all the way through this, for those of you that are vegetarian or vegan, I'm going to tell you all of the things that you can do to keep this thing on a track that will go all the way to vegan. And it's delicious. So don't think that you're scrimping and, and doing something that's going to turn out a lesser product, okay? So I'm gonna put about three tablespoons. I'm gonna cook it in the real traditional way with uh, the fresh rendered pork lard. And we're gonna need uh, to keep adding fat to this pan as we go through all the different steps. But the first step will be with um, about three tablespoons. I'm not measuring exactly here because I just need enough to coat the bottom of this pot really nicely. Um, we are going to toast these chilies in the fat along with a little bit of onion and garlic. I'm just sort of truncating steps here so that we don't have to do the onion and garlic separately because the truth of the matter is they'll cook in just about the same amount of time. So I've got the melted lard now. You can hear the crackle sizzle. I've got two cloves of garlic. That was just like a half of a small onion. Um, the garlic's peeled, but it's whole because that's what we really want. Here is to, to retard the time that it's going to, to um, brown. Okay, so now I've got the chilies in on top and I'm gonna use a, a wooden spatula just cause I think it works really well here. And I am literally gonna stand here now for five minutes as these guys toast and the onion and the garlic soften and lightly brown. Now this toasting step is really, really important. And I'm gonna show you what the inside of this looks like. It's a lighter brown color. Remember when we did all of the de-seeding and stemming, it was all dark on the inside. But once they have toasted on the inside, they will have that lighter color. What we're doing here is to develop flavor. Without developing flavor that way, um, the mole is very, one note, okay? I'm gonna take all of these, what we have in here, uh, and put it into the blender jar, directly into the blender jar. You know what I think would help me the most here is a pair of tongs. I was um, quite 
careful about getting all of the chili seeds out of the, the chilies. Usually I'm not that careful, but I want to use this pan for the next step um, without washing it out because we're going to go into another kind of toasting step. So I just wanted it to not have be covered with all those seeds. I'm turning that down just a little bit. Let's go over to the blender jar, put that on top. I have some chicken stock here, six cups total for this recipe, and I'm going to put about a cup and a half of it in here. Again, you're not seeing me measure. I just want enough to, go, to help blend these chilies. Uh, so I'm going to put about a cup and a half in there. We can always add more if we need to when it's blending. If they get stuck going through the blender blades, we're just going to leave that to soak for a few minutes while we do the next step. Now, the definition of a mole, the way that I think of it, is that it typically is a sauce that really features the, the flavor of chilies. Most people think of it as an ancient recipe, though this particular recipe or the base of this recipe, a mole poblano, has half ingredients that came from outside of Mexico and half indigenous recipes from Mexico. But they're almost always thickened with nuts, seeds, or corn. This one is nuts and seeds. So look what we have here in the second step. We have some almonds and some sesame seeds, and then there's always some sort of a sweet element that naturally is in the mole and it usually comes from dried fruit. We're going to start off by putting in these almonds into the pan here. So I'm going to first stir these guys for about a minute or two, and then I'm going to add to the pan the little bits of uh, sesame seeds, and you'll see how those start to toast instantly. So these are untoasted sesame seeds. I'm just pulling out uh, something that was a little dark there that I don't want to be in the mole. Uh, that could burn, but we're already seeing a little bit of browning going on here with the almonds. Okay, so we got a, you can see it now. There's just enough fat to kind of coat the bottom of the pan nicely. So in will go these raisins. That seems like a weird thing to toast, I know, but what you'll see is that they'll immediately start to uh, kind of puff up and lighten in color. And the same thing will happen when I put in, or not the same thing, but I will, uh, you will see it starting to toast immediately when I put the sesame seeds in there. And we're just gonna stir this again. You're gonna stir it constantly until everything is toasted beautifully here. Now, we're not going to through that whole toasting, soaking, uh, blending, straining, well, blending we're going to do for sure, but we're not doing the toasting, soaking. We're doing what I call just a really fast soak directly in the blender jar. That's what's going to save you a lot of time. Now, I'll say when you finish seeing me go through all of these steps, I will tell you that within an hour, you could have a very traditional pot of mole done. And especially for those of you that have looked at traditional recipes for mole poblano, and I've written many of them, um, and you know that it's going to take you four or five hours to accomplish it, I don't want you to only have mole once in your lifetime. And that's what a lot of you have told me. It's like, oh, I made the mole. That was quite an endeavor. I'm glad I did it once. Well, I'm going to give you a mole that you could do much more frequently than that. And it will be, I think it will be a back pocket recipe for you because you will love being able to make this. And it's so easy to make in a, in, compared to the traditional ones that you can just make some enchiladas with it. Okay, we'll talk about other things that you could use it on later. But we have to look in here because we are ready to move now. You can see that the little raisins have puffed up and lightened in color. The, we've got a gorgeous golden uh, hue to the sesame seeds and to the, the um, almonds there. And then I'm going to just take these guys. Um, I'm going to move it off over here because I don't want it to toast anymore. And I'm going to scrape this stuff into a bowl. So this, we're going to need to, this for, for cooking down the chilies here in a second. So I'm going to scrape all of this now into this bowl. And then when I finish with that, I'm going to rinse this out and put it back on the fire. 
Okay, we've got the pan wiped out now, so all the little stray sesame seeds have gotten out of it. I put it back onto the medium to medium high heat at this point. Um, I'm going to film the bottom of it with um, another spoonful of the fresh rendered pork lard that we're working with here. Uh, but you could use oil if that's your choice. Um, and let that melt in there and get ready while we blend these chilies. Now I'm working quickly here and I have a high speed blender. So within a minute or so, I can get these chilies into an absolutely smooth paste. Now, if I was working in just a regular um, standard issue blender, um, I would want to strain this mixture because probably some of those chili skins wouldn't get blended. Um, and it would probably take me two or three minutes to get it really, really um, to the point of being velvety like this. I mean, just look at that. It looks like just like melted chocolate. That's kind of what I always think about with this stuff. But I don't have to strain it. I'm gonna put it into here. You should hear a sizzle when it goes in there, like that. All of it will be scraped out and in here. And we're gonna stir this until it is reduced and thicker and darker in color. That should take another Something like, well, it depends on your, your heat source and again, the size of your pan, but it should take around four or five minutes. Now, just look at the difference in color that you see here. You also notice that it's really shiny. That's real critical, but most important is the thickness of it. Basically, what we're trying to do here is to sear the flavors and we're gonna mellow the flavors of the chili and we're in all of this cooking down the whole thing starts to pull together as one of the most beautiful flavors that you could imagine. Too little cooking at this stage means you're gonna have a harsh mole. So don't skimp in this stage at all. Okay, so I'm finished with that. We're gonna go on to the blending of the second batch of ingredients that go in here. I'm just gonna actually turn this off right now and come back to it. I don't wash the blender for this because it's just got stuff that's already in the pot. Um, I'm gonna scrape in here this mixture of the sesame, almonds, and toasted raisins. And then we'll talk about the other ingredients that are gonna go in here. So we have on this last tray in front of us here, um, some, uh, some tomatoes. Usually in a traditional recipe, they would ask you to roast some tomatoes. Um, this is fire roasted tomatoes in a can. It's about three, two thirds of a 15 ounce can, about a cup of tomatoes. And then those are gonna go in here. Couple slices of bread. This is one of the other thickeners that is very common in a, a classic mole, like a mole poblano. Some people would also put a toasted tortilla in here. So so you could swap out a couple tortillas for one of those pieces of bread if you wanted to. And now we're on to the spices, which really is what makes this mole quite unique uh, or makes mole unique. And it's black pepper, cinnamon stick, cloves, a bunch of stuff that's sort of tasting like it's baking spices in here, and then anise seed. And I'm gonna crush those in the Mexican uh, molcajete here. Um, and I'm not gonna use all of this cinnamon stick, just a piece of the cinnamon stick. Now this is true cinnamon, so it doesn't, it's not the cassia bark we usually call cinnamon. Um, and it just breaks very easily in your hand. And it's got a really lovely flowery uh, aroma to it. The black peppercorns, it might seem like that this isn't enough spices for such a big pot of mole. It's a, by mole standards, it's a small pot of mole, but it's, they're never overwhelmed by any of these spices. So I'm gonna crush it rock against rock until I get everything into an absolute powder. Okay, I'm just about there. And I tell you, when you make this mole, you are going to be in heaven right now. The smell of the cooked down chilies and these fresh ground spices. Of course, if you don't have a mortar to work with, then you're gonna probably use some pre-ground spices. But if you do have a mortar, 
take the time to grind them fresh. And then they're gonna go right into the blender jar. We've got some Mexican chocolate. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. On to the blender base now, this is all going to go. And I'm gonna add another, about a cup and a half, just enough to get all this mixture to go through the blender blades. Put the top back on here and blend. Now with a Vitamix blender, that has taken me about a minute and a half. Most blenders would take three or four minutes to do it, but let me show you what you're looking for here. Uh, when you take a little bit of this mixture and you rub it between your fingers, you should feel no sesame seeds left. And so this has got just the tiniest little bit of grit. If you're not working with a high speed blender, I highly recommend that you pass it through a, a strainer, just a regular strainer, nothing fancy, not like a chinois or anything like that, but just what I would call a medium mesh strainer. Uh, with this, I'm just gonna take the opportunity right now to put this back on the heat and about, again, about a medium high heat. Scrape all of this in here, and then I'm gonna stir it again. This is a lot of stirring, I understand, but it's we're gonna stir it again for about five minutes or so until it's reduced again to about the consistency of tomato paste. We're back to looking like melted chocolate here. If your mixture is really well blended, that's actually what you should be seeing here. I know this is a lot of stirring, but I will tell you that it is what makes this thing come together in flavor. Um, I brought this uh, spatter screen out to show you. Some of you may wanna do this spatter screen over just to catch any little flying things. But if you're stirring it pretty vigorously through the whole thing, there should be minimal uh, spattering with this thing. So, okay, now the last thing that we're gonna do here is to add the rest of our broth to this. You, well, let's just look, come on in and look at it because you gotta see what the consistency of it. I said it's as thick as tomato paste again, and um, it's very shiny. Uh, that's all the fat that's in here starting to separate out. Fat that comes not only from the oil or lard that you're cooking this in, but also from the sesame seeds and the almonds. So I'm gonna put the rest of our broth in here. The whole thing is gonna take about six cups and you're gonna end up here with someplace over two quarts of mole. If that sounds like a lot to you, just let me tell you that most recipes for mole making, because it's always made for a big fiesta, would make many gallons of mole and it would take two or three days of procuring the ingredients, doing the prep for the ingredients and um, doing all of the cooking. And then of course, mole is typically allowed to simmer for quite a long time and often served the day after because just like with any great stew, flavors develop and you can taste more nuance of things when you have it the following day. B freezes beautifully, so any leftovers can go into the freezer. What you'll want to do after you've defrosted it is to put it back in the blender and just re-blend and it'll just come right back together. So it's a very, very useful thing to have in your repertoire because within an hour or so of now and I do tell you you do need to have all your ingredients out don't be running and looking for things during the preparations always make sure that you measure out all of your ingredients and have them on the countertop to get this to go well because it's a lot of stirring and cooking so you're really busy through this whole thing I would say leave this on to simmer a minimum of an hour longer if you can, preferably two, three, four hours. Put it over a medium low heat. And then this is one that um, I made yesterday and I refrigerated it overnight because we have to talk about seasonings here. You'll notice a little bit of oil separating out on the top. You can just bail that off with a ladle if you want to or stir it back in. The richness 
on your palate of a good mole comes from having the right amount of fat in, in it. So I just like to stir it back in. You could use a whisk or a spoon to do that. Um, so if it has gotten thicker, then say, I, I would say like a cream soup consistency. Some people like their moles thicker than that. I like them sort of cream soup consistency, but this one's thickened up just a little bit. So I'm just gonna thin it with just a little bit of water or you could use some stock now. As I was telling you before, you can make a perfectly delicious vegan mole just using water or, or uh, vegetable broth through the whole cooking. I actually like water in this because I think it allows all of that complexity of the chilies, the onions and the garlic, the tomatoes, all those spices, the bread thickening, all of that stuff goes together to create one unique mole flavor. And I like to highlight that a lot of times. So to tell you the truth, lots of times I make it with water because I think that would work. Then you can serve it to your vegan friends and your meat eating friends. Just think about having a grilled chicken breast uh, with this mole on it or putting it in some enchiladas um, that have some roasted vegetables in it. Or maybe you've just grilled some eggplant and you spoon this over the top of it. Oh my gosh, it would be like one of the most glorious meals of your life but we have to get the seasonings right. And this is where a lot of people stumble. They don't know how to season it. There are two seasonings that go into it, salt and sugar, and you cannot leave either one of them out. It's very essential that you season it first, I say first with salt. And remember, we've got like two and a half quarts of mole here. So it's gonna take a fair amount of salt just to get it started here. So I'm gonna start with that part of it. I've seasoned a lot of pots of mole in my life. And so it's, I know kind of where to start, but um, in the recipe that will accompany this video, I will let you, um, I will give you the ideas as to how much to start with. Now that's not going to make the flavors all unified. I have to get the sugar in there to do that. But I first start with this, the salt flavor and, and I think I hit it almost exactly right. Remember if you're working with uh, salted chicken broth or salted vegetable stock, um, you're going to have to be careful because you will already have a dose of salt in this during the, the simmering period. Okay, so I think I hit it right. And now I'm going to put in some sugar. Now this will probably take more than what you think and you're not ruining the sauce by putting sugar in it. What you're doing is bringing out the elements, the fruity elements of the dried chilies. Remember, dried chilies are a dried fruit and you are wanting to bring that forward by the addition of the sugar here. For those of you that um, think sugar is evil, yes, you could possibly use something like agave syrup or one of the other kinds of sweeteners that you like to use, but you have to add a sweet element. Mole should be slightly sweet and richly salty. Both of those things sort of on a tight rope back and forth. I'm getting really happy now because to me, this is one of the most glorious dishes in the entire world. And to be able to create it, to be able to continue this tradition of making mole um, and who knows how it all came together over many, many centuries, but it's something that deserves to be made time and time again and shared all over the world because really this is the crowning glory of Mexican food. You might wanna use it in different ways than what they would traditionally be used in Mexico over some poached chicken or some turkey perhaps. Um, I love this mole on grilled swordfish. So think about things that a rich sauce like this could enhance, but it's a robust sauce. I love it on pork. Pork is absolutely delicious. If you grill a really beautiful ribeye steak, this can be absolutely wonderful on it. So you can think outside the box at the same time you're respecting the tradition of making a really world-class mole in, in just an hour flat, basically. So get in the kitchen, have this experience, fall in love with what is a very traditional flavor that's been, been developed by cooks over centuries and centuries. Have fun cooking.
chocolate. I forgot to talk about chocolate. We didn't ever add the chocolate to this pot. When you add the last edition of the broth, you put chopped Mexican chocolate in here. A lot of you would know that as sort of Abuelita uh, brand or one of the Ibarra brands or something like that. Um, there are a lot of different brands of Mexican chocolate, but you have to think of it as a seasoning that goes in here. This has not become a chocolate sauce, even though it is seasoned with just a little bit of chocolate. But in its natural state, of course, chocolate is bitter and it makes this sauce so beautifully complex, but never enough of it in there that it's going to make it taste chocolatey, just complex. Hey, welcome to the kitchen today. It's all about black mole. I can't believe I'm really doing this because I have never actually done a video of how you make black mole because this is, this is the, the thing that it's almost like the holy grail of Mexican cooking. And for somebody that's not raised with it, not taught by the grandmother how to make their version of black mole, it's really hard to find out exactly how to do it. Reading a recipe, which I did for years and years and years, um, it didn't give me enough information. And then I started going to Oaxaca every single year and tasting it and talking to people and watching people make it. I did that for 10 years before I actually thought I got it right, got it right enough to put on our restaurant menu. And then we haven't taken it off since. So let me show you what I've learned by many, many trial and error attempts to make it and lots of time with Oaxacan cooks. So it's not hard. All you have to do is first of all, have the patience to do all of the prep. Okay, that is the, the, the thing that I will tell you and I always, recommend to everybody divide it into three days. You're making black mole. You're not making it for Wednesday night dinner. It's an occasion. So think about it, get your ingredients together. And on day one, do the basic prep. I'll show you how we go through that. Day two, you're going to blend and fry the chili paste, blend and the nut mixture and add that to the chili paste and cook that down and then put some broth in there and simmer it straightforward. Not hard, but I'm going to show you the tricks that I have learned to doing it well. Then on the third day, it will have mellowed and you can come back and adjust the seasonings and serve it and arrive at your big event rested enough to really enjoy it, not having done all of that prep in one day or trying to do all that prep in one day. Okay, so the things that, I, that are so important about black mole is getting the right chilies. You can't do it without the right chilies. Um, the second thing is you've got to know how to toast those chilies exactly right. That is the most important part of it. So I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. But let's talk chilies first. Okay, so here what, what we have is the, the chili from Oaxaca that everybody talks about and says is essential to making a great black mole. This is Chilhuacle chili. Now, you could go to Oaxaca and bring these back, but as far as I have seen, I, they never show up in my Mexican markets. It's a thin-skinned chili that's almost crisp feeling like that, okay? Now, if you want to make black mole and you don't have the chilhuacle chilies, I'll tell you what people in Oaxaca do because chilhuacles are expensive in Oaxaca and not always in season. So what they'll do is use a guajillo chili. You want to choose the darkest one. Some guajillos are super like cranberry red. Those are probably not the best ones to use, though you can use them. Again, a thin skinned uh, chili that will substitute for the chilhuacle chili. Okay, second chili that we're going to talk about is chile pasilla, or is that they call it in Oaxaca, chile pasilla mexicano, the one that comes, say, from Mexico City. It is not the chile pasilla oaxaqueño, the Oaxacan pasilla, which is much spicier and smoke, is a smoked chili. And it's not, um, it's sometimes called the chile negro. So I usually write it up as chile pasilla negro. 
The last one here looks like an ancho chili, but it's not. It's the darker version of an ancho chili. It's a mulatto chili. And um, since I've got it right here in front of you, I will show you that these are not very good ones, okay? This is what I was able to lay my hands on here. And why do I say that they're not very good? It's because the pasilla here is really nice. It's very flexible. It's got a lot of shininess to it. This is clearly first quality and it's it's not, it's recently dried. It's not too dried out. This is sort of dull looking. And if I move it like that, it breaks. Okay. That's not what I'm really looking for here. I'm looking for a much more uh, supple chili, um, but it'll work. Okay. And sometimes you're going to find yourself in that same situation where this is what you have to work with. You can do it. You can make a really good black mole out of it. So the first step of course is to stem and seed all of the chilies. So with the chihuacles, um, that's going to amount to pulling the seed pod out. It may, the as you're doing that with one of the ch chihuacle chilies, they may uh, break into smaller pieces, but what you really want is kind of flat pieces for the toasting part of it. The chile pasilla, that's really easy to work with because these are such beautiful pasillas here. Um, I tear them open. Some people use scissors on it or a knife and you could feel free to do that same thing. Um, I just open them up and let the seeds fall out. Now, this is the point at which you can pull all of these veins out. That will make this this black mole less spicy. So that is where all of the heat is in the chilies. Um, but you really do want to get most of the seeds out of here. If there's a stray seed or two, it's not going to be the end of the world. But we're saving these chilies because they're going to add texture and color to this black mole. Okay, so that's a, a cleaned pasilla. Uh, collecting all the seeds together over here. And let's just see if there's something that we can do with these kind of dried out, uh, crispy looking uh, mulattoes. So I'm going to pull it off at the top like that to open it up. Now remember, I'm going for flat pieces here, so I don't want to make it into too small of pieces. So like that's a flat piece there. And then break that out and open that up. Take another piece of it, shake out the seeds on these, and then just tear it open without tearing it into too many, too many little pieces. Those are going to be harder to toast. But you can see that this is like, this is, well, it's labor intensive work when you don't have the best quality chilies. Otherwise it goes really fast as it would, as it did with the pasilla chilies that you've got there. Okay, I'll meet you back here when all of these are cleaned and we have collected all of the seeds together. Okay, I'm going to take some of these pasilla chiles and I've got the heavy skillet, 12 inch skillet. You really need to work with a heavy 12 inch skillet. I recommend working with uh, cast iron because that's what most of you will probably have. Um, and I'm going to make one single layer of the chilies, more or less. I mean, I'm not being very meticulous about that, but I'm going to lay them in here. Um, I've got it over medium heat, but I let it heat up for about 10 minutes or so, so that it was evenly hot. In Oaxaca, this would be a clay griddle that this would be done on. And I'm going to uh, just stand here and turn them until they are deeply toasted. Now, <clears throat> you hear me clearing my throat? It's because I didn't open a door. I didn't open a window. I didn't turn on an exhaust fan, but you have to. Okay, that is super essential in doing this because capsaicin is volatile into the air. And as you start doing the toasting, you're going to want a lot of air circulation in your kitchen. Otherwise, you'll find yourself just coughing and coughing. Now, come down here and look at this. This is really essential. Do you notice how that these have turned to a kind of tobacco color on the inside? They have turned from that completely dark interior to a more tobacco looking color of brown. And we are going to just turn them here. 
until that tobacco color brown darkens to um, a chocolate brown. And that's what I think, that's the way I describe what is happening here when it's just absolutely perfect for black mole. If you don't toast them enough, or if you try to go too fast and have too high a fire, you will burn them rather than deeply toast them. So this is the moment and I, I say, I do this in four batches and I don't rush it. I don't, I don't no more than medium heat here. I, I just let this go slowly through the stages. This is way more toasted than any chili sauce I know anywhere else in Mexico. And you may wonder, how did this ever come about? Because basically what we're talking about here is a sort of almost controlled burn, stopping before it actually carbonizes. But how in the world did this ever happen? I have no idea. But when you cook in Oaxaca, and this is a mole that is only from the state of Oaxaca, and it is the king or queen of the moles in Oaxaca. It's the one that you always do for the most special occasions. Um, you watch the people do their toasting and you realize that this really relates to so much else in their the culinary culture, that they like things that are toasted dark and they really, um, they celebrate a wider variety of flavors than any place else in Mexico. And that includes the flavor of bitterness. And that's what we're doing here. So let's go back down here and look at these chiles and see I've still a very tobacco uh, color there but in this one here I'm darkening up now but I'm not clear to the chocolate brown yet. I always say that this takes about eight minutes, eight to twelve minutes um, and just don't rush it. This is painstaking work but this is the work of making black mold. Okay, the first round of painstaking toasting is just coming to an end here. Let me just show you, remember that real tobacco uh, brown, now it's gone to chocolate brown. That is what I'm really looking for there. Um, and when I, when I do this with people in Oaxaca, um, they really just say, you just do it that much. They don't have words to it. So I'm trying to put some words to it so that you can be able to do this and get it just right. Another thing that I notice that is when it's perfect is this. Um, there's a little bit of crispiness on the exterior of the chilies. So you'll notice that like you hear that little little crunch there. Um, and that usually is the right thing. Again, that sort of chocolate color on the inside. So I'm going to put all of these over here. They're all ready now. And I just take them out one by one as they're getting toasted, appropriately toasted. Um, and then I've got three more batches of this before we come back to the soaking part of it. So starting at number two. <laughs> Okay, I've got hot tap water, as hot as it can be, uh, going into the bowl of the chilies, the toasted chilies. I like to put a, a plate like that on top just so that they are submerged and they will rehydrate evenly. Now, it's 45 minutes that I think is the perfect amount of time to soak them too little time soaking and they won't because these are really deeply toasted chilies. They're more dried out than regular toasted chilies. So they take a little longer to rehydrate. But if you leave them too long, like two or three hours, you'll just soak out a lot of the flavor and the color into the water. We're going to probably capture some of that by, by blending these with the soaking liquid. But at the same time, I think 45 minutes is about the right amount of time. And now we're on to to toasting the seeds, which you'll find very interesting. Now, all those chili seeds that we saved from the chilies, I want to take a quarter of a cup of them. Um, that seems to be the right amount for this. When I've worked with people in Oaxaca, they don't always use all of the chili seeds. Remember, these have been embedded into the veins where all of the heat is. So the exterior of all of these chilies is going to be hot, but you're not trying to add them for heat. You're adding them for depth of flavor and texture. So they're going to go into our skillet here over medium high. I mean, of medium heat, no, no higher than that. And we are going to just stir them around a little bit for um, this again. Is <coughs> 
<laughs> you <laughs> certainly want to have a lot of ventilation um, in your kitchen. Um, and this will take uh, four or five minutes for them to darken a lot. And then I'll show you what the last step is to make them less spicy. <laughs> Where you're just about there, you can see that they're almost black. That's what we're looking for. And when they get to that black stage, you'll notice that they get just a tiny bit shinier. That indicates that the oil is coming out of them. And so this is the time when I will kind of like put them to the side and in a in in kind of a small mound there. Um, I'm going to do this with a culinary blowtorch. Um, I know a lot of you, if you're wanting to make black mole, you've probably made creme brulee and you've probably invested in a blowtorch to keep in your kitchen. You can do it with a match as well. Um, but I find this to be the easiest way to catch these guys on fire. Um, so I will just like put it in a spot there and you'll notice that it catches fire right away. And... <clears throat> Then you just want to stir them gently around until that flame goes out. What you're doing here is to, to burn off the oil. And you are also in that same time going to be doing, uh, making them less spicy because a lot of that oil that you're burning off there. I'm going to catch it again. There we go. I kind of put it out so I'm catching it again because I knew it wasn't it didn't burn long enough to really burn that oil out that'll take a minute or so <clears throat> okay the flame has gone out I'm going to scrape them into a small bowl some people in Oaxaca actually pile the burnt seeds onto a tortilla and then light them and burn the tortilla with the seeds. Um, I don't find that that's the easiest thing to do, especially in my American kitchen. I'm going to put some water on these guys. You hear them sizzle in there. This will just get the ash off of them. We'll let them soak for just a few minutes. And now we go on to the toasting of all the rest of the ingredients, the toasting or roasting. And I will tell you, that stuff is child's play compared to what we've just been through. With the skillet still on medium heat, add the untoasted almonds. They could be skinless or with skin on them. Stir them around for about seven minutes or so as they darken, richly darken. Then scrape them into the bowl that you're going to put everything else into. Next we'll go the sesame seeds. Now they'll pop, so stir them around a lot. Um, it'll just take three or four minutes maybe for them to do. Just don't let them get away from you. You want to darkly toast them, but definitely don't burn them. Toasted peanuts just go into the bowl because they're already toasted or roasted. Then add some freshly rendered lard or vegetable oil. Here I'm using lard because it gives a really traditional flavor to this mole. Slice up the onion and add it to the skillet along with the whole garlic cloves. Now stir all of that around for, oh, seven or eight or nine minutes until it's really richly caramelized. You want dark, rich color here. Then scrape the onions and garlic into the bowl with all of the nuts and seeds. Now, if you need to add a little bit more fat to the pan, you want to have enough in here to fry the plantain. So peel that plantain and then cut it into little cubes and put them into the pan and stir those around until they're richly golden brown. Scrape them into the bowl. And then lastly, and you'll need a little fat in the pan to do this too, dump those raisins in there and stir them around. This doesn't really take more than about a minute for them to puff up. And you'll notice that they'll brown nicely and then scrape them in with everything else. Now put all of those herbs and spices into a mortar or into an electric spice mill and blend them. Not the avocado leaves. Those are going to go into the pot later on. Just the other herbs and spices. When they're in a powder form then put them in with everything that's in your nut bowl. 
Now we're on to the tomatoes and the tomatillos. Of course, when you buy the tomatillos, you got to take their little papery husks off of them. And then I'm going to roast them. Again, this would in Oaxaca be done on a big flat comal uh, clay griddle there. Um, but I like to do it under a broiler. So I'm going to slide these into the oven under the preheated broiler, just as close up as you can get to that. And then we'll set up this tray with a tortilla. This is a stale tortilla that you would be using for this. And half of a bolillo or a chunk of... Uh, uh, of a baguette that's about the same size. Again, stale is good because what we're going to do is to toast these things uh, darkly. So I'd say pretty much any kind of bread that you have around will work as long as it's um, not too fluffy white. You want something with some body because this is one of the thickeners here for this. So we'll just lay all of this out. And then as soon as that gets broiled, which will take about, I'm going to say about six minutes usually, um, and then we'll flip them over and roast the other side. And then I'll just put these under the same broiler and let them darken. Uh, you have to kind of watch those because they could get away from you pretty fast. So just a nice deep toast on all of these things. Okay, we're down the home stretch of all of this toasting and roasting and sauteing. I'll put the roasted tomatillos and tomatoes and all of their juice into the nut mixture bowl here. The same thing with this toasted bread and tortilla. To that, I'm I'm going to add about three cups of broth here. I've got seven cups measured out because that's usually what it takes for this. So I'll put about three cups of it in there. Yeah, that looks like we hit that on the head and then just mix all of this. I know it doesn't look like a very attractive mixture here, but when you taste it, every single element here is going to contribute something really important. Now, I've done a pared down version of black mole for you, but when I was doing all of my research to sort of come up with what I thought would be doable for you, I came across recipes that had 40, 45 ingredients. <laughs> I think this is what, this is very close to what we do in our restaurant and I think it's uh, imminently doable. Okay, so with that up there, let's talk about chilies now. Um, oh, I've got my chili seeds here. I strained them out after a couple minutes there and those are gonna go into that bowl as well. And the, the chilies themselves, our next step is to determine if the water for the chilies is really bitter. So that's just a, a taste test here. Um, our waiting plate, we'll go over to the side here. Now it's a dark liquid, soaking liquid there. I'm tasting very deeply toasted flavors, but I'm not getting a lot of bitter. I'm not getting a lot of bitter, like in tannin bitter, like you would find in some young red wines. I'm not getting that. I think it's good. If it was super bitter, I would just do this next step with water, but then I'll say that the mole won't come out quite as dark a color. So I'm using a high-speed blender here. I will tell you, if you don't have a high-speed blender like this one, what you're really going to end up with is doing the blending maybe three or four batches. But again, this is just an exercise in patience from the very beginning to the very end of it. So I'm gonna use the tongs. I, with this blender jar, I have to do two batches of them. And once I have blended them with some of this, this soaking liquid, just enough to come up to about right there on them, not to cover them completely, then I will, um, I will strain it into another bowl and we will be ready to do the other really important step which is frying down the chili paste until it's really the darkest almost black color you could imagine i'm going to tip off some of this this liquid here and that should do it almost up to the top there and now we start the blending process <clears throat>
You can tell by the color of it that we really did a good job on the toasting of those chilies because this is that really, really sort of bitter chocolate color. And I'm using just a medium mesh sieve. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say one thing. Um, I put just enough of the soaking liquid in here so that everything went through the blades, but it's, it's the minimum amount possible. That's really important. If it sticks in here, add more, of course, if it's not blending everything. If you're not seeing that sort of tornado of chili puree going through the blades, then you don't have enough liquid in it. But you don't want to put too much in here because that next step of cooking down the chili puree will take a lot longer. So I'll scrape all of this in here. I do want to show you what it's like when I, what I'm going to get out of here um, before I blend the second batch of the chilies. Okay, I started the blender at a very medium speed and then I kicked it up to the highest speed of the blender and let it go for several minutes. Um, and you know, it did a really good job. That's all the chili skin that I'm getting out of here. That was the unblended part of all of this. But so now I've got to go through the second batch of the chili puree. Second batch of chili has been pressed through our sieve here. Just again, very little of that. I'll set that to the side. And now we're gonna go set up here. I've got a pot. Now you want one that holds about, I'm gonna say anywhere from eight to 12 quarts. If you have a 12 quart stock pot that's pretty heavy, then you could do this cooking in it. Actually, the bigger the pot, the easier it will be because um, you'll see in a minute that there's some spattering that goes on here. I've got a the spatter screen, just one of those inexpensive spatter screens because I find that they come in really um, in a handy way. I've had this pot, this is cast iron that's got an enamel coating on it, which works really well for this. Of course, in Oaxaca, you would be doing it in one of those uh, cazuelas that are made out of earthenware, glazed on the inside, unglazed on the outside. And you would probably be doing this step outside on an anafre, which is um, a brazier that has a some charcoal in it and you would just nestle the pot right in the charcoal. I've got this over medium high heat. I'm going to put a quarter of a cup of the uh, fresh rendered pork lard in here. Um, now this, this may look like a lot when you're measuring it out. I know what it's supposed to look like in the pan, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, but you want enough fat here to um, to do this frying of the chili really well. Um, and that's really important whether you're using oil or lard for this. You want to make sure that you have a really nice coating. I'm going to say it's about an eighth of an inch thick all over the bottom of this pot. And then I'm going to add the, I want to make sure that the chili, I mean the fat is hot enough that I hear a sharp sizzle. And then I'm going to put it in here. It will probably start spattering right away, but that spattering will kind of go away for a second as this is coming up to temperature. And this is the point at which you just stand here again. This is really um, an exercise in patience because you want to stand here and stir this. And I'm going to say almost constantly for the next 8 to 12 minutes until it's really, really thick, almost to the consistency of like a tomato paste, if the tomato paste was, was hot. If you don't stir it, it won't, all this won't happen as fast. Um, but I say just keep after it. Stand here and stir it and stir it and stir it and it will reduce and thicken. This is the most... Well, one of the most critical steps, the toasting of the chilies is the other really critical step, but the cooking down of the puree is super important. Then once that's finished, we'll be on to blending the nut mixture and adding that to this. You can see what I mean about splattery here, but I got the splatter screen to minimize as much as I can. It's very thick now. If this were to cool off, it would be almost the consistency of tomato paste. Some cooks like to cook it in a little bit more fat than I did and they will say that you have to wait until the fat separates out on the top. 
Um, I don't think that's absolutely necessary for this, but you will hear that in a lot of the recipes. I'm going to turn it down now, and then we're going to go over to the blender and start the next blending. Okay, our other mixture, <laughs> and it really does contain a wide variety of things is in the blender. If your blender's not this large, of course, you'll have to do this in a couple of batches. Um, and I just want to make as smooth a puree as possible. If it gets caught where it's not going completely through the blades, I will add a little bit more broth to it. Okay, that was a, a lot of blending there. Now, this particular blender comes with this um, pressing stick in there. And I don't know of another blender that has it, but it does keep, help me to keep everything moving in there because it's a fairly thick mixture. Of course, I'm going to press it through a strainer now. Again, a medium mesh one, not a real fine strainer here. And... I will need to have a spatula to get it through. You want to run the blender as long as you can stand it until this gets to be a very smooth mixture. Yet we always strain it in order to get any pieces out that haven't blended well. Sesame seeds are pretty hard, so they're the last things that will blend up smoothly and you may catch some of them in your strainer. Okay, not too much here. Again, just like a tablespoon of stuff. Now I'm going to take, I want to get all of that off of that spatula there. And then I'm going to remove our spatter screen and add this to the pot. My oil is beginning to separate out there, as I had talked about before. Stirring constantly through that first section not only makes it go faster, but it also makes sure that nothing sticks and burns on the bottom, which I think is really important. Okay, all of that is in the pot now. I had turned this down after I had reached the right consistency in the black chili paste that we have here. Now I've added the other mixture to the pot, and I'm just going to turn it back up to medium high, stand here and stir it again for about 10 minutes or so. I actually didn't quite get the right number on the chili puree. I said about 10 or 12 minutes, and it really took us 15 to get that to cook down. Um, and you'll see that our mixture lightens up a lot now. But in that cooking of the chilies down, what you're doing is to increase sweetness, which is really important in this dish, and to push to the back all the bitterness. Um, and I, the only way that you can make that happen is cooking in fat like that, stirring it. Um, I've seen some of the commercial places that do the, the chili pastes or the mole pastes, and they have great big cauldrons that have automatic stirrers in them. They just go round and round until they've reduced their chili puree to a chili paste. And oh, no full well that that's the only way to get that really authentic, delicious, balanced flavor in a mole. So we'll stir this again now for about 10 minutes as it thickens too and darkens, but this is not as important as that first edition was. Okay, our gurgling pot of black lava here is gonna is ready. I'll take a, this off so you can take a look at it down in here as I stir it. But it is almost exactly the same color as the chili puree was. But you see that it is, so I gotta get it covered. I'm gonna add the rest of the broth, the four cups of broth to it, and then just stir that in. I can get rid of the spatter screen now, um, but you do have to know that I have been wiping this up, that even that spatter screen wasn't containing all of it um, as we're going along now. Okay, so we're kind of done. We have the hard seasoning part to go. We got simmering and then seasoning. Um, so let me just 
move that over there. Uh, with two, two last ingredients that are going to go into this pot for the simmering phase of it. I've got a spatter all over there. Um, I always recommend that you wear something the color of this while you're doing this because you can see that I've got spatters all over my white chef's jacket. We've got the Mexican chocolate just chopped up there. The leaves, the avocado leaves. Now I just put these into the dry skillet right at the very beginning and toasted them a little. How do you know when they're done? I say they're done when they, they, they'll give off just the slightest wisp of smoke, but really they fill the kitchen with this beautiful aroma of toasting leaves. Okay, so those are just going to go in there. Um, I'm going to poke them down in there, stir the chocolate in, it'll just dissolve. This is Mexican chocolate. Um, I've used the Tassa brand a lot. I think that's a, a really good quality version of that, heavier in chocolate. But now I'm going to come over here. Actually, I'm going to move it back over closer to where we are because we have to talk about consistency and so forth. I have another batch of black mole, if you can believe this. We've been through, this is the second time through this whole thing. And I've got this batch of black mole, which has been simmering over here all the way through. I would say that it's not... It's a little bit, you can see a little bit of fat has separated out on top. That's fine. Um, you can stir it right back in. Let me put that down and I've turned it off. I just had the simmering on the lowest possible, um, but I wasn't stirring it very much. So you can see some little pieces down there. Now, I don't think it has enough liquid in it. We could be using, I'm just using chicken broth for this. You could add more of the chicken broth, but what you have evaporated is water. So unless you want the chicken broth to come out as a very big player in this, I would thin it back out with a little bit of water here. So just stir that in until you get it the consistency of what I would call kind of cream soup. Um, some people like it thicker, some people like it thinner. You can make that choice on your own. Now I've already seasoned this one. Um, but I'm just going to pretend that we haven't seasoned the other one. Um, and so let's talk about this. Uh, what we would have over here, I'll use this same wooden spatula to stir this guy over here. So I've got this kind of over medium heat now. When it comes to a simmer, I would turn it down. I'd put a... Uh, the lid slightly askew on this. And after a couple of hours, I would be ready to season it or to let it go for even longer. I will say the longer you let it simmer, the better this will be. And then if you will cool it down and put it away in the refrigerator, come back to it in a day, maybe even two days or three days, it will have integrated the flavor so much better. That's why I always recommend making it one day and serving it the next. And if you're really organized doing all the prep on one day, then making it on the second day and serving it on the third or fourth, it doesn't really matter. And I know all of you are going to ask me, can you freeze this? Absolutely, you can freeze it. If when you defrost it, it sort of looks broken. Don't worry, just put it in a blender. It'll come right back together. So it, it freezes really, really beautifully. Okay, so say this has already simmered for a couple of hours and it's time for me to, to do the seasonings. I will start off by giving it um, a good amount of salt to start with. This probably is not going to be the right amount of salt, but at least I can get started here with uh, a couple of teaspoons of salt in there and then go from there. Now, what I want you to do is to start to taste because this is going to be for a lot of you, a brand new experience. But say I put a couple of teaspoons of salt in here and I stir that in and then I give it a taste. You're not going to be terribly impressed with it at this point because, um, and, it, and I also have to say, this depends on how salty your, your uh, chicken broth was. If the chicken broth wasn't salted at all, I'd probably start with a tablespoon of salt in this to start with. Um, but I knew I was working with uh, salted chicken broth. So I'm going to taste it. And it should have a kind of complete savoriness to it at that point. Of course, I'm tasting that this hasn't simmered in very long either, but it should have this real rich savoriness. And so I like to add salt first 
to get it to that place where if I was thinking about this was a pot of chili, say, would it be at that level of saltiness? And then I'm going to bring out all the other flavors by adding something sweet. Now, some people will do work with really rich stock, especially pork stock has a tendency to go real sweet. And so you could just add that all the way through, cook with that and have the dilution be all of that. And that could give a nice flavor. But mostly people in Oaxaca will add sugar to it at this point. Now that may seem like the wrong thing to do because most of us that come from the European tradition, you don't ever put sweet into savory food, or if you do, it's considered cheating. This ain't cheating. And this is really essential in getting the balance of things right. And you'll notice it when you start with this. So I've got some, I, this is a third of a cup measure. I'm gonna start with a quarter of a cup. So not quite full on this third of a cup of measure. And I'm gonna put that in here to start with. Those of you that are averse to sugar, um, you could use agave syrup. Um, that would be sweet. It'll, it'll give a different texture to it and a slightly different flavor. I wouldn't suggest something like honey because that will take over this pot. Um, so now I've got my two teaspoons of salt which actually were just about right for me. I've got a quarter of a cup of the uh, sugar in here. And by the way, I am also using organic sugar here, which is always a tan color. And that tan actually equals flavor. It's a much richer flavor. It's not as devoid of flavor as white sugar is. Mm. It's like a whole new world of flavor. All of a sudden I can taste those chilies, the plantain and the raisins, they start to come out. Even the fruitiness of the tomato will start to come to the surface. So that's where I would sort of leave this for a while. And that is one of the hardest things to get right. But if you're making it according to these directions, probably you will get to that quarter of a cup of sugar and two teaspoons of salt in the ballpark. That's not going to be enough to, to actually serve this because those are going to kind of, in, or those, the salt and sugar kind of integrate into the flavor of this. And so tomorrow, or maybe in, even in a few hours, this will need a little bit more of both of those things. But right now, I'm kind of happy with where it is because going from salty only to sweet, <laughs> Just there was an explosion of flavors and you need to add sweetness for those things to come out. Just the way you need to add salt to something for the savory flavors to all come out. So there's your pot of black mole. As patience requiring as it is, you make this the way you would make any kind of special dinner for a special occasion. And I hope that you guys will tackle this I'm not going through all the way to serving it with something, but I am going to show you a way that you could serve it. So give me just a second to get ready for that. Of course, black mole is the star of the show here. And uh, a lot of times in Oaxaca, they will serve it with poached chicken. I like to use grilled chicken. You could do grilled chicken breasts or legs or thighs, whatever appeals to you. Um, some people, of course, like to do uh, turkey that they poach. I actually, if I'm going to do turkey, will oftentimes put the turkey in uh, turkey breast, just a boneless, skinless tur boneless turkey breast with the skin still on it um, and just put that into the pot and poach it directly in here. That's anathema to people in Oaxaca, but I think it works really, really quite well. Um, I've got some pork loin roast here, which I think is really, really delicious with it. If you were to come to our restaurant, Topolo Bampo, we would do a, a seared piece of Wagyu ribeye to go with the best sauce in the Mexican repertoire, perhaps with a little piece of seared foie gras beside it and before you recoil completely if you've never tasted good black mole with foie gras um, there's no reason you shouldn't I'll tell you it's a really amazing amazing experience but this is the star of the show so you don't really 
decorate it up with too much stuff. There's never going to be sour cream and guacamole going on this. In fact, the people in Oaxaca don't even put nuts and seeds over the top of it like they do up in Puebla where sesame seed always has to go on it as one of the ingredients here. Now I tasted this mole again just while I was cutting up this roasted pork loin and boy all, this is the one that we made before and all of the sweetness had sort of gone hiding so I had to add more. When this is finished it should have a slightly sweet edge. Don't think that that's going to be imperceptible. It's going to have a slightly sweet edge. So I added a little bit more of the the sugar to it. I just used the sugar here. And I'm just going to make a, a beautiful plate presentation, but a very simple one here. Um, and I believe that this is what this sauce deserves because as dark and mysterious as it looks, I will say its flavor is so incredibly dynamic that you certainly don't want to take the focus off of it in any way, shape, or form. So just putting some pork roast like that on there. Got a few sprigs of flat leaf parsley to kind of lie on or lay on here willy-nilly. Um, just kind of sprinkle them around. And I, I honestly think that that's kind of all it needs. But I hope that this gives you an idea of ways that you could possibly serve this beauty. It is so spectacular. I can't wait to hear what you guys come up with and I know that you'll be sharing your photos of the black mole that you have made because you guys are just so amazing in your determination to master the real Mexican kitchen and I am honored to be able to share it with you. So thank you so much for sticking with me all the way through from the beginning to the end of black mole. Have an adventure. We're moving into the holiday season and I wanted to share something that is a major Mexican tradition um, and that is making ponche to serve at the Christmas parties, the ones that are called posadas. And they start the 15th of December and go till the 25th, but you could be invited to one every single night. Now there's three essential things for a posada. The first is the ponche that I'm going to work through with you today. Second thing is tamales. Third thing is a piñata, usually for the kids, the, but the adults sort of get into the action as well. So when you're talking about ponche, we start by thinking of it first as a warm beverage. So it's going to be delicious, sort of sweet, sour, warm beverage that is at its base a tea, a sweetened tea that is made from tamarind and jamaica, the little uh, relative of the hibiscus here. So you have to go and get those things wherever you get them. Of course you can get them online, but I'm going to encourage you all to go to a Mexican grocery store because starting the beginning of December, you'll walk into the store and everything will be about ponche. You'll find the tamarind, you'll find the jamaica, then you'll find the second thing that goes in there and that's all the fruits and the sugar cane that go in there. And then the third thing that go into, that goes into, well, it can go in to the ponche is a little bit of rum. Okay, so as they say in Mexico, you can serve it straight or you can serve it con piquete with the little bite. Okay, so I'm going to show you all the way to getting through this. We start with tamarind. Now, if you want to make the best flavored tamarind tea, you're going to start with a tamarind pod. They have a barky exterior on them like that. And you just kind of crush that exterior and let it fall down. And if you have really good uh, tamarind pods, they won't be too broken up. But if they are broken up, it's no problem at all. Um, it just, you'll have a lot of little pieces that you have to get off. But as I am crushing this, I'm getting a lot of little pieces as well. So you do that. Then I grab it on this end where you see these little strings coming out. I grab it on that end and then pull it. So I get the strings out of it. 
And then we're going to collect all of those. You got to get all those strings out. Well, you will get them out at one point or another anyway. And then we're going to take all of the peel. This is eight ounces of the peeled tamarind and put it into a bowl here along with two other ingredients. Now this is Hamaica. So when you go to um, any store that sells Hamaica, and sometimes this will uh, be called hibiscus because it's in the hibiscus family. It's not actually a flower. It's the part that's on it that covers the flower. It's the calyx of the flower. And you want to look for ones that are really dark colored like that, almost like a beautiful maroon color. So I've got a half of a cup of that. So like a, a generous half ounce. And then I've got Mexican cinnamon that always seasons this. And I want about a two inch piece. Now this is the true cinnamon. So it's going to be very light and flaky. It doesn't look like the American cinnamon at all, which is really cassia bark. So we'll throw that in there. And then I'm going to cover this with uh, two quarts of boiling water. Let me grab it underneath there. So I've got that to pour over this. And then this will steep until it is uh, cool enough that I can put my hands in it. That's actually an essential thing because I have to dislodge the seeds from the tamarind petals. I mean, tamarind pods. Okay, we'll put that back over there. Now let's talk about alternatives for tamarind. Some of you will find a tamarind paste. This one comes from I believe from Vietnam, and it is a just a block of that tamarind that you saw there, but without seeds in it. So you would use um, uh, the equivalent amount of this, which would be about three quarters of a cup or so of it. And then you might find some of this in the Indian grocery stores, <clears throat> which is a tamarind concentrate. But when you open it up, it's very liquidy. You can see it kind of moving around in there. This is the least fresh of all the, the ones I think in terms of flavor. The most fresh being the tamarind pods that you actually take the barky husk off of. Now while that's cooling down there, uh, let's talk about the fruits that go into the, the ponche because they're, they're very prescribed in Mexico um, and I part of the fun of making ponche is to get these fruits from Mexico. So I walked into my local Mexican grocery store and I found the three things that go in there. We've got the two fruits, the guava and what's called tejocote or hawthorn in English and the sugar cane. But then right by these fresh fruits and the sugar cane were the frozen versions of it in a special chest freezer that said everything for ponche. So you get the tejocotes, the guavas, and the sugar cane already peeled. And then in the, the aisle that had all the fruits in cans and jars, I found the ponche there. And what does it have? Yes, it has exactly the same things. We've got the hawthorns, the tejocotes, the guavas, and the sugar cane in there, all ready for you to use making the ponche. So I'm going to use the, the fresh stuff since we have it, and I'm very lucky to do that. Let's start with the sugar cane because that may surprise you. Um, if you've never seen anybody work with sugar cane before, um, you have to be sort of rambunctious with it here. Um, so at the place where you see the segments there, you just use a big knife to cut it. And then I'm going to go, actually, I think I may try this, this knife. That one's a little unwieldy for that. Uh, but you can cut this exterior off of the, the sugar cane. So you want to peel it. I'm just showing you this so that if you ever find yourself working with real sugar cane, fresh sugar cane, you'll know what to do with it. I'm not doing a very good job on that one there. I, I cut too much off of that one part of it there. Um, but we have to get this really thick exterior off of here. And it's not something that you could do with a vegetable peeler. You have to do it with a knife. Okay, 
So there's a sort of sloppy version of what you would do. And then you want to cut it into basically two inch pieces and then cut each one of the two inch pieces into quarters like that. So I've got some more of this that I've got to cut through now. So maybe I'll get better as I go along. That's a lot of work. I guess I would probably recommend to you to buy the already peeled frozen stuff because it'll be really good and easy for you to work with. Um, I discovered or remembered after I started working in those longer pieces that it's actually way easier to peel this if you just cut them into the two inch pieces and then peel each one of the two inch pieces. And that's what I've got here. Now let's go on to the guavas. Um, guavas are really easy to work with in a lot of ways. Here, I'm going to cut one open and then with a small spoon, I'm going to go into it like that and I'm going to take out all of the seeds. Now, there's a lot of flavor in those seeds, but it's not going to play here. You could make a little jam out of that and strain it, but those seeds are extremely hard. Um, and so you want to get them out of here because they will not make your ponche good. Uh, but the flavor of guavas, if you haven't had them, is incredibly tropical. It is one of my very, very favorite of the tropical fruits. So I have a, a few more of these guavas to do after uh, cutting them. I mean, after taking the seeds out, I'm going to cut them into little strips like that so that they distribute very nicely through our ponche. Okay, those are going to go back onto the tray here. If you buy the frozen ones, just defrost them, but you still have to go through that same seeding process there. And then we have the hawthorns, the, the tejocotes. What do they taste like? Well, it's a kind of light flavor that's floral. And I think that the floral quality is what exactly people are looking for in those. If you don't find them or you only find jarred ones, that's absolutely fine. You could just put more of the guavas in there. I would love the guavas. Um, but you don't do anything to them. We're just going to put those in whole. We've got our, our peeled sugar cane right there. And when this is cooled down enough for me to get my hands in it, I'm going to show you what we do to take those seeds out of the tamarind pods. With clean hands, you can go in here and take the soaked pods and you're just going to kind of, I, I just like to squeeze them like that. So we're trying to get all the pulp off of the seeds. Now there's not much of a, a way to do this other than to use your hands and the pulp of this is the good stuff. That's what we're really going for here. So you just pull them up one at a time and work that pulp away from the seed. Don't worry about taking the seeds out because we're going to strain it once we get this all done. Now this is finished. I have dislodged all of the seeds, but if we were going to be using the brick of tamarind paste, um, that would have just gone in. You have to kind of tear it up into smaller pieces. That would have just gone in with the hamica and uh, just soaked until it, it cooled off enough that you could handle the whole thing. But you just have to stir it and just make sure that it's dissolved. The concentrate, the same thing you would just measure in the, and in the recipe, the quantities are all going to be given for all of those different options there. But try working with the tamarind pods sometime. I just think the adventure of it is really fun. So we're going to now strain this mixture. Look at what a beautiful color that is. It's just really lovely. Strain that mixture back in here. I will just move it around to make sure that all of the solids stay in the strainer, but all of that pulp goes out. I think we've got that there. And then we have 
the sweeteners to talk about. Now this is because it's a very traditional dish, um, the, the sweeteners tend to be very traditional too. And that would mean that we would be using piloncillo or the, the cone sugar. Now it usually will come in the Mexican grocery stores in two different um, ways. It'll either be small cones or big cones and both of them, to tell you the truth, will usually come in light and dark. So you might find a lot of different options. For this one, I like to choose small cone light because you can just throw them in here and start dissolving. Um, they are not really hard to shave. You can use a, a big knife and just shave them like that for very quick dissolving, but you don't have to do that because it is sugar and yes, it will dissolve. So I'm just going to drop these three in here. Um, if you were using, that's going to give us just about uh, four ounces or so of the sugar. If you're using one of the large cones and it weighs about eight ounces, it'd be about half of this, but this you will have to cut. Somebody told me a really interesting trick. You can put that into the microwave for just about 20 seconds or so, and it will unstabilize it enough because there is liquid still in here. It's the raw sugar with the molasses still in it. It will unstabilize it enough that the, the cone will just start to fall apart. So you might want to use that trick. And then I've got some white sugar that's going to go in here. All piloncillo to me is um, a little heavy for this. So I just want to let that, I'm going to put that over the fire here. And then we will just stir that until it comes to a simmer. And all of that piloncillo, those cones have been dissolved. While that's working, I am going to chop up a couple of apples. Now, everybody's got their own version. After you get your tamarind and jamaica base that's cinnamon scented, um, and then you get these three elements that pretty much everybody puts in their ponche, People start putting in all kinds of other things. More, or more spices could go in there. Different kinds of uh, seasonal fruit could go in there. Um, I'm keeping it kind of simple because there's enough going on here for you to, to say grace over. So I'm gonna put a couple of apples in here as well. I'm just going to quarter them, core them, and peel them, and then chop them into small pieces. <music> Scoop the apple in here. The piloncillo has mostly melted now. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you don't have piloncillo, you can use brown sugar for that. It has a little bit of a different flavor, but it'll still be really delicious in this. Then we've got all of the special ingredients, the hawthorn or the jocotes the guavas, and the sugar cane. Now, if you haven't ever worked with sugar cane or had sugar cane served to you this way, uh, just know that it's very fibrous and you don't chew it and then eat it the way that you would eat the apples or the pieces of the guava. You actually chew on it and then you will dislodge its special sweetness and then you just get rid of the little fibrous stuff that's in your mouth. Um, we'll let this simmer for just a few minutes and it'll be ready to spike or not and then serve. If you're going to spike this, I would recommend about a cup of white rum. That's the, um, the kind of you could put tequila in it if you want, but I'll say that in Mexico, they typically would put in this aguardiente, which is aguardiente de caña or a cane rum, a very simple cane rum. Um, so I'm going to add that to it. I've got a very low fire now. Um, <clears throat> and oftentimes you could just leave it unspiked and let everybody have a little bit of shot of the of the rum in their own glass. This is an earthenware mug that is typically used for serving the ponche. Um, interestingly enough, in many of the Mexican groceries in the United States, this is such an important thing that you will find them there. So if you want to have a real Mexican posada, I highly recommend looking for these to um, have in your uh, in your possession for having your Mexican posada. Now I'm going to ladle some of this in here. Um, you want to get some of the solids and then some of the juice. 
I like to serve it with a spoon, which is very typical. This puts me right back into Puebla. Um, the most memorable ponche that I ever tasted was at a posada that was in a churchyard. And somebody had made this really beautiful, beautiful ponche. And they served it in these earthenware um, uh, mugs like this. And we stood around in the brisk air and enjoyed a really warming mug full of ponche. Hi everyone and thank you so much for joining me here in my kitchen. It's time to make tamales. Now before you go, oh, I don't know, it seems like a huge endeavor. Number one, I'm going to talk through all of the important parts to just make it something that is within your ability to do. And number two, I'm going to make a small amount so you don't have to think you're going to commit to making five or six dozen tamales because that's the way most tamal recipes are written. But you have to have a few things and they, we're going to start with the steamer because the steamer is absolutely essential. These are steamed little packets then that's what makes them so special because everybody just unrolls them. Now, most people think about tamales for Christmas time um, because if you're going to have a, one of the posada Christmas parties in Mexico, typically there's three things that you have to have to make it work. One is tamales and number two is ponche that you're going to serve to everything, everyone. And then the third thing is a piñata for the kids to break. So, Everybody outside of Mexico thinks tamales are only for Christmas time. And yes, they are a special thing, but in Mexico they have tamales all the time. Even restaurants that specialize in nothing but tamales 365 days a year. So let's talk through each of the uh, ingredients and equipment that we have to start with. So let's, the, because these are steamed, let's start with the steamer first, okay? So I've put all of these different steamers out here for you because some of them will work and some of them won't work. Let's do the ones that won't work first, okay? Okay, so this is a little steamer that I use a lot um, and it is a steamer basket that's like that. Very simple. Maybe you have one of those collapsible steamers that you would put down in a pot like that. It may or may not work depending on what the depth from the steamer bottom or the collapsible steamer basket um, and the top is because you need about five inches and the tamales have to stand up while you're steaming them. This is only about four inches, so that won't work. Same thing happens with these Chinese steamers. Um, they only give me about three and a half inches over here, so that doesn't really work for me. Um, of course, in the Mexican markets, every Mexican market that I think I've ever been in, there has been a tamal steamer for sale because they're a special kind of thing. I have the big one that's the normal size that people would have if you're gonna make your five or six dozen tamales. But then I found this small one, which I just love, but I haven't seen it since. But it's just a small tamal steamer, and you can see that there's a great depth here. You put the water in the bottom, this piece comes out so that you just fill it with water down there, and then you put your steamer shelf in there, and then you've got your beautiful little tamal steamer. But there are other things that you could choose too, besides just your little collapsible steamer in a deep pot, which works absolutely fine. And to tell you the truth, that's what I used for years here in the United States before I bought a tamal steamer in one of the Mexican groceries. If you have an Instant Pot, I will tell you that right now <laughs> they offer as a, you can find these um, online, it's just a steamer basket that fits right back down in there. Now, what I have done is to put the steamer attachment that comes, the, the sort of steamer shelf that comes with the Instant Pot down in there first, and then you buy this little silicone thing and set it down there, and then you put it on steam, 
put the top on like that and then let it steam. We're going to steam for about an hour. That's what tamales take, which you will absolutely love because it will fill the house with this glorious, glorious fragrance that is the only the aroma of steaming tamales. Now let's go on to ingredients since we've talked about different kinds of steamers. So first of all, you can't make any kind of tamal without masa. So if you live in a place that has really good tortillerias and you want to do something really special, go to the tortilleria and ask for masa para tamal or the masa for making tamales. It is more coarsely ground and drier than the masa for making tortillas. Or you can go to a Mexican grocery store and buy this very, very well-known brand of the, the masa for tamales. And it says right there on the label in big letters that it is for tamal. It is not a white bag. It's a cream colored bag. You will notice the difference right away. And if you don't see it, ask around and say, what it, where's the masa for making tamales? And then you just reconstitute that. I have reconstituted that with three quart this, the, for this recipe with three quarters of a cup of hot tap water. And that's it. Now, this, I, what I want you to show you is this is the masa that we get from our tortilleria that makes the masa for, um, the, for us to use in our restaurants um, for making tortillas or for making tamales. And you see that it will hold together if I just squeeze it. So it really is damp. It's damp enough to do that. And when I'm working with the, the reconstituted tamal masa, I want it to look sort of like that as well. So I can squeeze that together, but I can also just let it fall apart. So that is our masa part of this. Now, the next thing that we need to talk about is the fat that is used to make tamales. So typically in Mexico, it will be fresh rendered pork fat or what we call lard here. Now, if lard is not something that you're going to choose for religious purposes or reasons, I completely support that. But if you're one of those people that just came up thinking that somehow lard was a bad ingredient, I'm going to ask you to rethink that because Fresh rendered pork fat that is done at a high temperature tastes like roast pork. It's absolutely delicious stuff. So I'm going to ask you to think about the possibility of using some lard, but where would you get it? So I would say you would have to go to a butcher to get it or go to a Mexican market, but don't just go for the stuff, the national brands that's in little bricks there. That stuff has very little flavor. It's hydrogenated, so it's not good for you health wise. You would go back to the meat department, say you have the good stuff, the good lard, the one that you may be used for making carnitas. They will help you. If you're not going to use the lard, then I want to make sure that you get something that's not hydrogenated. Um, you know, there's national brands that are out there. This is the one that I would use because this is made from all palm kernel oil um, and it is solid at room temperature. So it will be just like any of the other vegetable shortenings that you would be used to working with. But today, what I'm going to do is to work with the masa that we get from the tortilleria. So the tamal masa from them. And I'm going to use the fresh rendered pork lard. Yes, I'm a lucky guy because we we have a pig farmer that gets all or does all of the, the pork that we use in our restaurant and he renders this beautiful, beautiful lard. In most Mexican households, they do a lot of the beating of the tamales dough or batter by hand. I'm not going to recommend that you do that because it takes a lot of time. So I'm going to use just a stand mixer here and I'm going to put the, the fat in here and don't worry. If all of this is just too much information for you, we've got you covered in the recipe that is going to be attached to this video. So I put the, and I'm not going to tell you the proportions because you'll need to go look those up anyway. I'm going to put the lard in here um, and then I'm going to start the beading. I want it to lighten in color. And while it is lightening in color, and this by the way is not cold and it's not warm. It's just at room temperature, making it the most pliable that it could be. 
I'm gonna add a teaspoon of baking powder to this and a teaspoon of salt. And now I'm looking at it and it's already lightened a lot in, in color, which means that literally it is getting air pumped into it, which is what we're looking for. If it's very hot in your kitchen when you're doing this, you'll want to put the fat that you're using for a brief time in the refrigerator to cool it down a little bit so that you can actually beat some air into it. Now, on a slow speed here, I'm gonna add this masa in three additions. So there went about a third of it. Make sure it's well mixed in. Another third of it. Beat that. And then our last third of the masa goes in. And that's a really, really stiff looking mixture now. So we're gonna soften it up with a little bit of chicken broth. If you're doing these and you wanna make them all vegetarian, I'm gonna make a chicken filling, but you could do a vegetable filling. Um, but I, we could do this all vegetarian and in our restaurant we do do a bunch of them vegetarian. I would use this shortening and I would use vegetable stock for it. But now I'm gonna put in about a cup full of, the, of this broth but in order for it to sort of get softening up the masa, I'm going to do it slowly here. I'm just going to pour it in in a very thin stream as it mixes into the masa. Now I have a cup and a half of broth here because a lot of times you will need that much. But usually for me, it's about a cup that I need. So I'm gonna stop before I have used up all of this broth. So you can see it now it's starting to look like a thick cake batter. And let's see where we are here. I'm right at the cup full. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna stop with that because I, this is the most important thing that I can show you is what the consistency of this batter is supposed to be like. Um, it's sort of like making bread. When you're making bread, sometimes the flour will absorb more liquid or less liquid. So what you're going for in bread making, of course, is the feel of the bread dough. Sort of the same thing happens now with this. And I'm gonna turn it off and then open it up so that you can see what the consistency of this is. But look at that. It just looks like a, a beautiful cake batter. It will fall off of my beater like that. It's light and fluffy. I'm gonna put this back on, beat it for just another minute to see if I can get more air in it. And I'm gonna show you this sort of classic test for determining whether you've beaten the masa enough. So I'm gonna put this back on and beat it a little bit more. Okay, open this up, and I'm gonna just take like a half a teaspoon. I'm using it, a measuring thing for this half a teaspoon, but you don't have to do that at all. Just a small spoon. And I'm gonna take about a half a teaspoon of it, and I'm gonna put it onto this ice water here. And you'll notice, let me get the ice out of the way there. You'll notice that it just floats, okay? That means that we have beaten it well, and it is, um, it's got enough air incorporated in it that it can float. Now there's lots of different kinds of tamales. I'm gonna be making a chicken with a green salsa on it, steamed in corn husks that are light and fluffy. That's very much a central style tamale. There are so many different kinds of tamales in Mexico. They range all the way from the really fluffy ones that I just described in central Mexico to almost pudding-like ones that are often wrapped in banana leaves. But for today, I'm going central style. I'm gonna do the light and fluffy ones in the corn husk because that's what you're gonna be able to accomplish really the most easily of any of the tamales that I could show you. 
In just a second, I will be back ready to make the filling with you. Chicken tamales with a really punchy salsa verde. They're some of my favorites. They're some of the most commonly found in Mexico. And we're gonna do what you've seen me do many times is to roast some tomatillos, garlic, and some green chili. Now you could use any kind of green chili that you have for this. This It could be jalapenos, it could be serranos, which is what I'm using here. But if you have some in your garden, something that's green and spicy, you might wanna do that. Those of you that are real aficionados of spicy, spicy food could make an habanero version of this if you would like to. All of those things would be great. A very classic uh, technique of roasting everything, though we are going to do it under a broiler rather than on the stove top like it would typically be done in Mexico. Um, I've put these all on a rimmed baking sheet. I took the tops, the little stems off of the chilies, and the garlic is still in its papery husk. These will go under my preheated broiler here, um, really close, about four inches below the highest setting that my oven offers. And after about six minutes or so, they will be blotchy black. And then I'll flip everything over and we'll roast it for another six minutes. Sometimes the chilies need to be pulled before that. Sometimes the garlic does, but we'll take a look at it as we're going along here. So I'm just gonna slide these in there and I will meet you back here when they are ready. No, I know this doesn't look very pretty, but this is the, what's going to be the best flavor. Um, you can see that our chilies are very roasted. They've cooled down now on the, on the sheet here. Um, there's juice that they've exuded as they were roasted. But I'm going to put everything, after I peel this garlic, everything into a food processor. You could use a blender for this. Um, the little papery skin is what really helps the garlic not to burn. And you know that burnt garlic is probably not going to be the most delicious thing. It can get a little bit bitter, um, but uh, roasted garlic has a lot of sweetness, which is why we actually do this part of it. Um, so I've got my garlics now all peeled here. Everything will go into the food processor together, including all that juice that's on the baking sheet. Um, but you, it's, I know it's not very pretty, but wait till you taste this. If you've never done this. Oh, and by the way, those of you that don't like to scrub the rimmed baking sheet, you can put a piece of foil down and um, then just get rid of that foil. Everything will have been roasted on the foil and makes for a really easy cleanup. If you have a silicone mat, that would work as well. Okay, so that's all in there. Now, I'm gonna get rid of all of this so that we can make this basic salsa verde. I'm not gonna cook it, I'm not gonna turn it into a sauce with any um, addition of broth or anything because I want this one to be really punchy so that I don't serve the tamales with a salsa. Now, that's very common in Mexico. Rarely do you see tamales being served with a salsa. So I want this filling to be like salsa and filling all in one. Okay, so I'm gonna let that run for just a second. I don't want it to get smooth and pureed like it was um, like out of a can, something out of a can. I want it to have a little bit of texture still left in there. So that looks like it's gonna be about the right amount. Um, I'm gonna scrape because a lot of that goodness went up here on the top of the food processor. I'm gonna scrape that down in here as well and then all of this will go you'll choose some sort of cooked chicken to be with this i've got a couple of grilled chicken breasts which i'm happy to say you can actually buy now in a lot of frozen food counters so you could do that some rotisserie chicken or if you have some chicken breasts or chicken thighs that you just want to poach in water until they're done um, make sure that the water is salted so that they have some good flavor to them um, that's all, really all you have to do that is coarsely shredded. Uh, when I say coarsely, finely shredded would be to just pull everything apart like that. But this is in what I would call coarse shreds. Um, so I'm gonna mix that into the salsa. We're gonna, we're missing just now a little chopped cilantro and some salt to add to it. So in a typical way of 
chopping cilantro, I will take the, the bunch of cilantro that I pulled off of here, and it's a pretty good amount here that I'm using because I want that flavor to be present all the way through the steaming of the tamales. So cutting very thin slices crosswise, not taking the leaves off, but chopping the stems in with everything. And then when I run out of leaves down here, I will stop, get rid of the, the, leaf, the stems there, put that in with the rest of our mixture. Now I know that that chicken has had a little bit of salt on it already. So I'm not gonna go overboard with the salt on this. I just wanna do enough to really season it. So I know what that will take here. And it's probably about that much. So more in that sort of half teaspoon range. And this is what you want your filling to look like. Very simple and straightforward. If you have another salsa that you like, if you had a jarred salsa that you really like, maybe you're gonna open that jar and put that with your chicken and work with that. I just wanna make sure that making tamales is not that, some, that something that is way off in the distant future, but becomes part of everyday thinking in your kitchen so that you could say, yeah, I'm gonna make some tamales. I'm gonna have some people over. I'm gonna celebrate a birthday and I'm gonna make some beautiful tamales and take that steamer to the table and just fill the room with that absolutely glorious aroma. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the forming of the tamales. Now, corn husks are available in lots of grocery stores in the United States, uh, depending on what part of the country that you're in. Uh, certainly in Chicago, we find them lots of places and in every Mexican grocery store. This is the variety that we find a lot in our grocery stores here. It's a product of Mexico, and it's a little different than the ones that I see in Mexico. The, you'll notice that there's a sort of blunt cut here at the end, and the ones in Mexico tend to be more of the base of it that curves in, actually making it a little bit easier to form a tamal in them. Okay, now the first thing that you got to do is to, to soak these so that they become pliable. That takes a couple of hours. If you wanted to boil water and pour it over, I just use hot tap water and, and do that. The boiling water might speed it along a few minutes, but you could soak these overnight if you wanted to. Uh, but two hours is usually a good amount. Now you want to choose a dozen really nice uh, leaves here, big full, full ones with no tears in them. Um, um, and oh, look at that one. It's really gorgeous. That's really, really big. It's almost too big. I'm going to tear off a little bit of that one there. And we're going to collect these um, ones that are a little, they're too small to make tamales out of and use them in the steamer to have on the bottom. Um, but these are really, really very, very nice ones. Um, if you find some that don't have um, they're, they're not, they're broken in the middle. Um, you can double them up if that's all you can find. Um, but I often will take the ones that are the smaller pieces and put them down in the bottom of the steamer. Now this is that sort of pasta steamer, asparagus steamer. I've got water in the bottom of it here. And I'm just going to take the, the corn husks that are not big enough to use for making tamales and lay them kind of like in a sort of star pattern to cover the bottom of, of the steamer. That will add extra aroma to all of this. Now, I want to dry these guys off a little bit, or we can just do it one at a time as we're working through them um, and uh, form tamales with them. So we'll start here by laying a large corn husk, soaked corn husk in front of me with the cutoff end toward me. The next step is to take about a quarter of a cup. I'm gonna measure this. Usually you don't see people measuring this because they know they can eye that amount, but a quarter of a cup is a standard size tamal. And I'm gonna scoop that right into the center of the base of this corn husk here. 
I want to get all of it out, so I'm going to do that. You can see why using a quarter cup measure is a little bit cumbersome um, after a while. And then take a spoon. You want to leave about a half of an inch on this end. You'll see why in just a second. And you're going to make about a four inch square, if you will. Something that's like about like that. So you can see that I'm working on, I'm working toward this flat end here and I want my four inch square to be in the middle. Then I'm going to take a portion of the chicken filling and put that down the center there. I think that will be about the right amount. And using the two sides of the corn husk, I'm going to roll this filling in the masa. So I'm going to completely cover it like that. You can see that. Then pull these two sides together. You can see the outline of the masa in here. And where they meet here, I'm just going to roll it around like that. And then where you see that the masa stops, I'm going to fold that under. And then that is the standard, the most common form for making a tamal. Some of you have probably, so I'm going to stand it up in here. Um, actually, these are kind of hefty corn husks, so I'm going to pleat it at the bottom, not pleat it, I'm just going to really squeeze it at the bottom to make a tight fold there and then just put this guy right here on the side standing up. You never want these guys to be lying down and you can see now why you need a deep steamer to accommodate them. Now there are probably a lot of you have seen very fancy ties. There are some people that like to make their tamales and then they fold both ends under like that and they will t tie them around. That makes a really small tamal that is tight in there. Never as fluffy, I think, as the ones that are steamed standing up with an open end to them. But sometimes people will take little strands of the corn husk and I will show you this one um, now as a second version of it. Uh, and this is actually if you're starting out and if you've never done these before, you might want to try this thing. <laughs> But this is the moment that you could employ the little ties. So you would bring that up like that and go around and make a little knot in it. And that will keep it completely shut. Most of the people that make tamales for a living, they just, they don't do that tie part of it. But this will keep them in really good shape standing up in here. So I've got another 10 or so. This might make 13 or 14 by the time we're done. But I've got all of those to do. And then I will show you what it should look like when we're ready to go to the steaming part of this recipe. Now you don't want to tie these too tight. Um, because they are going to expand. Remember, there's baking powder in them. That's one of the reasons that we leave that half inch at the top so they can kind of come up and expand. I usually give them just a little tap like that and then fit them down in here. Now, you look at your steamer. If there's any open space, they will have a tendency to slip down, which is not good during the steaming. So I've got a couple of balls of foil and I'm gonna just make sure everything is kind of tight in here so they're standing up not tight tight but they're standing up nicely and then fill in the little extra space here with a couple of balls of tin foil that will keep everything in position now i've got my water here i haven't turned it on obviously because i was working with making the tamales here but a little trick that everybody talks about in mexico is drop a coin in the bottom of the pot 
because you don't want to run out of water and you can't really see it very easily. So I'm going to put the top on here and then we're going to bring it to a boil over high heat and then regulate the temperature so that we see steam puffing continuously out. It doesn't have to be at a raging, roiling boil, um, but it, it needs to be a steady steam uh, for this about an hour and we'll come back and we'll check them after that. That rattling little penny that I put in there is still going, which indicates to me, I mean, I can hear it, um, and it indicates to me I still have some water. Now, if you don't hear it, that means you're running out of water and you'll want to take this thing apart a little bit and put some water in there. I always like to put hot water in there so it comes right back to a, a boil. But with a good inch of water, you should get through most of your hour of steaming. Now is the moment. <laughs> we are going to uncover this thing and pull one of these beauties out and make sure that it's cooked. Okay, so here's the way that you would determine if it's cooked or not. First of all, of course, I've got to get the tie off. It might be easier for me if I just cut this tie like that. And then we want to make sure that it it is not sticking still to the corn husk. So as we unroll it here, see how it just comes apart? So that indicates to me that it is completely finished. These are going to be very tender at this point. Most people will tell you to turn the fire off, let them stand in the steamer for 15 or 20 minutes. They'll still be really, really hot, but the masa itself will sort of start to firm up and then you'll have um, a really beautiful, oh man, look at that. <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, even though it's kind of fall apart tender here, I'm going to, um, they're so light, so beautiful so full of flavor. I made that salsa pretty spicy so that um, all of that flavor comes through there. If you decide to make tamales for the holiday or any other day,